Before we get into the singing, I just want to publicly thank Lynette for hosting us the other night for potluck. Uh, I didn't hear the police chief complain about us, so I guess we kept the noise down. But seriously speaking, we had a good crowd there, and and uh, I was sleepy all the way home. So the food was good. The company was even better. 52. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay, now you're going to play with me. 238. 238. 238. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, holy. The morning star song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God over all and blessed eternally. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the crystal sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who wast and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in thine love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who thy work shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God over all and blessed eternally. Two forty. Two hundred forty. Oh. 
Holy Spirit, faithful guide, ever near the Christian side. Gently lead us by the hand, pilgrims in our desert land. Weary souls for rejoice while they hear that sweetest voice. Whispering softly, wanderer, come, follow me, I'll guide thee home. Ever present, truest friend, ever near thy aid to live. Leave us not to doubt and fear, groping on in darkness dream. When the storms are raging sore, hearts grow faint and hopes give o'er. Whisper softly, wanderer, come, Follow me, I'll guide thee home. 788. 788. 788. Sing. Them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and duty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Love. Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life sinless to the loving call wonderful words of life also freely given wooing us to heaven beautiful words wonderful words wonderful words of life beautiful words wonderful words wonderful words of life sweetly echo the gospel call wonderful words of life offer pardon and peace to all wonderful words Words of life, Jesus only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Would you mark 556 in your books, please? 556. And would you join me in a moment of prayer, please? Holy God and Eternal Father, it's indeed an honor, a privilege, and a responsibility to approach your throne of grace. Grace because we didn't earn it, but responsible because you've enabled us to be. Father, there are so many that need our prayers this morning. We have some of them listed in the bulletin, others that we don't know about. And while we petition you on their behalf, we want to also say thank you for many that have been ill that are doing much better. Father, we praise you and honor you this day. We pray that everything we do and say will please you well. Bring a smile to your face and an honor to your name. And Father, we need your help. We have an enemy that would love to destroy us. He loves to destroy what he can and what he will, and, and he loves to watch you cry about it. 
And Father, we need your help and strength. And while we know that the denominational world's not right, we know the things they do there, people see us through them and help us to be distinguished and unique. And Father, we just ask that you will forgive us of our sins because we're not perfect. And we thank you for all who are here. Bless us at this time as we study. And may, Father, everything we do and say please you well. Be according to your will. Bring a smile to your face and honor to your name. Thank you, Father, for being our Father. And thank you for allowing us to be your children. And it's in his name we pray, Jesus. Amen. One of the things that I'm a typical man about is I don't like going to the doctor. Now, that's not Doc Morris. But when Doc Morris and Dr. Carter and the acupuncture was not working, I was afraid there was something more serious. And so I started turning to doctors, and one of my favorite doctors was one of the first ones I had. The only trouble is he had a heart attack after he had moved to Marinci and stopped practicing over here at COVID. So we went through the gamut of muscle relaxants, painkillers. In fact, one of those things that I took caused my episode in 11. And the doctor said, if you ever do that again, I will kill you myself. Okay. I kind of like that doctor. But I go to doctors, and one of them told me, he said, well, if you get rid of that gut, you wouldn't have that problem. I said, Doc, you're right, but the only trouble is trying to get to where you want me to hurts to do. And then I lost 27 pounds in Las Cruces in five days. And then my primary doctor got all over me about it. And I said, well, Doc, you're always telling me I need to lose weight, but not that way you you can't please them. <laughs> and I've got a good one now. In fact, he called me back in April and he said, hey, I want to see you. And I said, oh, you want some more of my money, huh? And he said, yeah, He said, but I need to check you out. And he doesn't try to shove you out the door like most doctors do. And we visit and talk and, and he was very concerned about me with my school episode he thought I was suicidal and I probably was to a point but I'm not going to let the devil win that one but some of the things that were said to me by that by those individuals were just absolutely cruel and the only one I could turn to was the great physician turn to Matthew chapter 22 or 23 please The great physician, we sing about it from time to time. The great physician is now as near, the sympathizing Jesus. He, he speaks his drooping heart to cheer, oh, hear the name of Jesus. And if it hadn't been for the Lord, and if it hadn't been for his sympathizing heart, you might have been taking me to Oklahoma to bury me. I don't say that to be melodramatic. I say that to tell you I haven't been treated that cruelly that I ever remember in my life. They were picturing and describing somebody that I didn't even know. The people that had to do the investigation that knew me personally didn't know. And that investigation lasted six months, and that girl has never been punished for anything. Oh, that was the other part that Satan poured the salt on the moon about. And the only one that would help me, the only one that could help me, was Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? Look at verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her 
How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So what is it? What is it that they now have? They have a desolate house. See, your house has left you desolate. Verse 39, for I say to you, you'll see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And by the way, that psalm is quoted over, especially in 2 Peter, Psalm 118, 26. And the reason I love this Savior, and the reason I love this physician is, first of all, he came to find me. He came to find me. You see, I was sick. Now, I wasn't sick physically. Look, what I'm doing right now, everybody would have told you, oh, that's what Dwayne's going to be. I was made fun of by friends. Oh, he's a preacher's kid. Well, I wasn't a preacher's kid. I was a farmer's kid. And they would try to ridicule and make fun and everything they could. And you know what? None of it worked. One Christian brother who said he was my friend said, you know what? If you want to hear Dwayne preach Sunday, come and hear him preach on hell because that's all he preaches about. And they all laughed and I said, but Mike, you should know. Jesus preached five times more on hell than he did heaven. Oh, I'd love to preach on heaven all the time, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love to talk about the great reward we have? And, that, and these, these are great and precious promises, Peter said. And one of those great and precious promises is about this physician. I had a guy one time and he accused me. Is that all you ever preach on is positive stuff? You don't ever preach on negative stuff? I said, you weren't here last Sunday, were you? He was just visiting. And we've got somebody who came to seek the sick. Now, he put it a little bit differently in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, but the same application. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. In 1983, we had a traumatic event happen in our area. You have to understand where I'm from, we kind of live out in the middle of nowhere. We we go about our business. We know everybody's business. They know ours, you know, small town. And about 20 miles directly southeast of us, a little place called Chillicothe. And I wish the gospel spread this fast. It, it there was a little boy and his brother, they were playing at the city park. And when they were playing at the city park, the boy recognized something. We, we have never figured out how he knew. And he pushed his brother, his little brother, and said, run with everything you got. And little Bradley Eugene Gilbert tried to run as well, but they caught him. And for six months, that boy was missing. I'm going to tell you his mother had something to do with it, but we never could prove that either. And finally, after six months, they found that little boy, about eight years old, found him in the Lower Pease River near Vernon, Texas. Now, why that was so close to us is because my youngest brother, was eight years old. My grandma started calling him little Eric. You're looking at the only individual that barely gets away with calling him that. Because you see, I love to call little Eric, little Eric, because he stands six foot four and weighs 375 pounds. And my mother enlightened me one day. We were in, in the middle of Houston at the San Jacinto Mall. And I got separated from my mom. I looked for my mom and my Aunt Billy for two hours. And I was so mad when they, I said, where'd you go? They said, we went this way. And I said, well, I went the other way. 
And I said, you guys got to watch Eric. He's going to get kidnapped. My mother finally pulled me aside and said, I want you to look at what I'm looking at. He was in sixth grade. He stood five foot 10. He weighed 240 pounds. She said, now who in their right mind would kidnap that kid? But I guarantee you, if somebody had tried to take off of that boy, my mother's a little petite, but she could get riled up. You see what Jesus came to do? Matthew 9, 12, I came to seek the sick. Those who are well don't need to have a physician because the problem is, what is the sickness? It's sin. Now we tend to, oh, that's a church word. And, and you know, what I do in private is my business. And what I do in public, well, you can't say anything to me because the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, that'll be used against you. You know what I tell kids when they tell me don't judge me? I go, too late. You already judged yourself. Shut up, Springer. You're right. The real sin is sickness, or real sickness is sin. And how many have sinned? I didn't put it in the notes, but this is one of your memory verses, or it should be Romans 3.23. How many have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Everybody. We emphasize Romans 6, 23, and that's good. The first part, the wages of sin is death. What we tend to forget is the second part, and we tend to not even believe it. What? I believe the word of God. Don't you tell me that, Dwayne. Okay, let me run it by you. For the wages of sin is death. I don't know of any member, member of the church that's put Bible memory in their brain. I don't know of any member of the church that's studied long enough that doesn't know that scriptural. What they tend to forget is what I tended to forget. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It can't be free. What's the old adage? If it sounds too good to be true, it what? Probably is however this is true this is absolutely true you sure it's free i am positive ephesians 2 and verse 9 2 and verse 8 and 9 says that the grace of god is called the gift of god i got a new present from my seventh period class this year they drew me, and I'm like, my glasses are like this, and, and my glasses are down here, and I'm going, and I did it for them, and they were laughing hysterically. I said, is that really what I look like? They go, no. So I'm going to laminate it and put it on my wall. I have another present from another kid that said, Mr. Springer's the worst teacher that ever existed, and I wish that he'd be, he'd be dead. So I laminated that and put it on my wall. And then the kid comes up to me first week of school the next year. Mr. I'm disappointed. I didn't have your class. You were my favorite teacher. Huh? <laughs> I have gifts given to me by students that don't mean anything to anybody else. And I've had other students tell me, why do you keep that stuff? Why don't you throw it away? Because it was a gift. It was a gift. I've had gifts from my kids. They don't mean anything to anybody else, but they sure mean something to me. My dad, if he were here, he'd tell you one of his favorite things that my brother Brian told him. We're out trying to put an engine on a combine and dad's ranting and raving and using words he shouldn't be using. And all of a sudden, he says, I can't do anything anymore. And my brother, who revered my dad, said, yes, you can, Dad. You took the engine off that combine. My mother started laughing. 
my dad turned around and he started laughing. And I was like, wait a minute, I got to find out what this is. I jumped off the tractor and we all had a good laugh for 15 minutes. Come to find out all we had to do, and I, I should have thought of it, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't allowed to think. All you had to do is take the tires off the combine, lower them. All we needed that much space. Finally got the engine back on the combine, and then it broke down again. But isn't it interesting how God knows sin and he created us anyway and he loves us anyway and when we go to him we go through the high priest we offer our sacrifice which we're doing this morning one of the many and we kind of consider it like uh compared to what you've done we're not doing anything <laughs> and he goes that's not true. Going back to my when my kids give me something. Oh. Didn't cost them anything. Man, they drew some things that were cool. And you couldn't get me to trade that. My dad threw a tie at me one time, for example. At my grandma's funeral. I said, that tie looks nice. And he threw it at me. I said, Dad, I didn't tell you that to get a tie. He says, you're going to use it more than I am. I wouldn't trade that tie. In fact, I was upset with the cleaner because I thought they lost it. I had to go back to the cleaner and say, I found it. And I do apologize to all of you. He's given us a gift. It's called the grace of God. Mercy treats us less than our sins deserve. Oh, if they'd have just repented. People look at me and they'll, they'll say, well, don't you, don't you want to go back to first Chronicles 7, 14? I said, every time I want to go back to first Chronicles 7, 14. And they look at me and they go, but, but Dwayne or second Chronicles 7, 14, sorry. But Dwayne, it's not that simple. Is it? If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and repent. I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. I mean, I'm fascinated how Moses ever got God to change his mind. I'm fascinated as to how certain individuals could talk to God and, and he would go, for example, Jonah. I've relented from the disaster because they repented. And then Jonah got mad at God. Talk about mm, topsy-turvy. Because see, the great physician still willing to, to heal. One of my favorite verses is Luke 4.23. Now, in the context of Luke 4, he is quoting from Isaiah 61 in the first two verses. What did God send him to do? To heal. To teach. And you can list those other things there. And all of a sudden they're looking at him. The Pharisees are looking at him and saying, you know what? You're not who you claim to be. You're not the son of God. You're not the Messiah. You're not the promised one. Why, you're just a kid. Oh, how many times I wished I'd have been able to write down how many times members of the church told me, you don't know anything, Dwayne, you're just a kid. And while I was just a kid, the thing that kept missing was I was maturing and growing. And I have a huge amount of respect for, for people that are seniors at my age. That's not what I'm getting at here. But when they looked at him and they denied him, he said, do you know what you're going to say to me? Physician, heal yourself. Physician, heal yourself. And the problem, Paul says, is most people are sick. 
most members of the church are still sick. Remember when he talks about the Lord's Supper there? And he said, anyone that partakes of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood. And he said, for this reason, many are sick. You have members of the church who think that the most important part of the service is the Lord's Supper. You have members of the church who think that the most important part of the service is the preaching. You have members of the church who think that the most important part of the Lord's Supper is just to be there, or the, I'm sorry, the most important part of the worship service is to be there only about 10 minutes. Where did we get the idea that God is to be shortchanged? We already struggle with the idea that we can't worship him enough. We can't thank him enough. But I've never read in scripture where we're going to have to worship him enough. I've never read in scripture where we're going to have to say thank you enough. You know what I watched one time? And this kind of reminds me of the way it works in Christianity. I never got to go to church camp when I was a kid. We couldn't afford it, and Dad needed our help, and I'm not complaining. But the preacher in Stillwater, Oklahoma, asked me, hey, he said, would you help me with church camp this year? I said, I wouldn't know the first thing what to do. He says, oh, he says, he said, I'll show you. And we did. We had a good time. And then it came time to have a water balloon and a water fight. Well, I'm almost as bad on land about, a, about getting wet as I am a swimming pool, but not quite. And so Lanny gets out there and he starts it. Well, there's this elderly woman who's been in a grouchy, grumpy mood all week long. In fact, I told Lanny, I said, you know, I love brethren and I love members of the church, but you've got to send that woman home. She is starting to destroy the camp. And he goes, I'm afraid you're right. And sure enough, we got out there. I couldn't believe the woman went out there with us. And the, girl, and the kids would get ready to throw something at her. And she'd go, don't you dare. And this went on for 15 minutes. Well, thank God Lanny didn't take no for an answer. He found a five-gallon bucket of water. We made the camp director mad because we took the water out of the baptistry. <laughs> and all of a sudden, when he dunked her in that five-gallon bucket of water, she stood there and everybody just froze. And it was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. She could not find enough water balloons to hit us. She couldn't find enough. And the kids were, and the kids were like, What's the matter with her? And they were like, you better run because you're going to get wet. And sure enough, she, I mean, hit them and hit them and hit them. And I'm like, I can't believe this. And the kids just said, don't you send her home. We'll be mad at you after that. I'm like, I couldn't believe a five-gallon bucket of water could change somebody's attitude. Maybe that was part of her rebaptism. I don't know. But anyway. But we had the biggest time after that on Thursday and Friday. We were disappointed camp was over with. She was in there just a hooping and hollering with the kids. Sometimes we get into those traps, don't we? We get into those, we we think we're, we think we're, we think we're. One of my favorite statements from Baptist preacher Chuck Swindoll was, he says, he said, you know, I, I said at 60, I was old. He said, and then I preached on Moses. He started at 80. And he died at 120. He said, I'm 85. He said, I'm not going to dare say anymore what's the Lord got in store. And the point he was trying to make was, is that sometimes we get into these traps where I can't. I can't. I can't. You've heard me preach long enough. You know, I'm going to tell you, I got two women in my life. One's in the grave and the other's in the, at home. And they look at me in the face and can't never did nothing. I know it's poor English, 
but can't never did nothing. And it's amazing what fear will do to you. It's amazing what fear will do to you. When I talk about most people are sick and when I when I bring this out in 1 Corinthians 1130, I think about <laughs> this verse. James 5, 16. This is where we get the idea. If you want to come forward this morning at church, we'll be happy to pray for you. You don't have to do that. You're not going to hell if you didn't come forward this morning. That is not what I ever want anybody to go home thinking, because I did for a long time. <laughs> Got told some wrong information by well-intended members. But James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. The effective working prayer of a righteous man avails very little, doesn't it? Is that what it says? No. It avails what? Much. Look at the last two verses he puts in James 5. If someone goes and brings a brother back, let him know that he's only covered one sin. That's what we tend to believe. What, what did he say? How many sins? A multitude of sins. But just as important, he has saved a soul from what? Death. You know one of my biggest fights I have at school? I have a middle school set of kids thinking they sh they're going to die, thinking they want to die. That they want to die. Why do you want to die? Oh, because I just do. And they haven't got the clue what, what they're talking about, but they're serious. Why do you think we have the suicide hotline? Why do you think now you have to dial 575 uh, on your phones before you dial your number? Because it's serious. And when he does, he talks about this 1 Thessalonians 517. And Wendell Winkler says in his, the cure and its habit, or the heart and its cure, I'm sorry, that the most fragile habit we have is prayer. The most fragile habit we have is prayer. Because what we do is we tend to, you know, life is like this. And when it's good, do we tend to pray as often? No, we tend to pray more when it's not. I had a member of the church that took me a while to figure out why he was always wanting me to pray with him, which I'm happy to do. Things weren't going well. He was trying to get his business started and he was very successful at what he did. When he got his business started, oh, I don't need to pray. Everything's going good now. For shame. For shame. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Now, that does not mean pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because Paul wouldn't have written that. Paul wouldn't have written his letters under the direction of the Holy Spirit. It means never get out of the habit of prayer. And then the devil comes in and he starts saying things like, good grief, Dwayne, did you hear that prayer this morning you made? Nobody was impressed with it. Nobody cared what you had to say. I mean, they were about to go to sleep during your sermon anyway. Would you just please stop preaching? Would you just quit the church? Now, he didn't tell you this stuff. That's cool. But he tells me this all the time. Most of the time, I adopt Dr. Harvey Porter's Greek word. You know what Dr. Harvey Porter's Greek word is? <laughs> I got to tell you, there's times I listen. 
And then I go, wait a minute. Would you turn to Romans chapter 8, please? Wait a minute. What happened over there in Romans chapter 8? What is it that I got to tell the devil? Because you see, I can stand there, and the devil's not impressed with me standing there. I can I can turn around and say to the devil, hush, and he'll he'll run. But this is what he's really, he really does not like. Verse 26. Likewise, Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we all know how to pray, and we always know what to pray for, as we ought. That's what we tend to believe. Would you read it again with me, please? Let's read, let's read it right, Springer. For we do not know what we should pray for, as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So how do we know that we're right with God? How do we know our prayers are right? Verse 27, he who searches the heart of the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And how many of us don't love verse 28? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. And you continue on that, that uh, set of questions down there at the bottom, verse 31 through 39. And then finally it gets through your thick head if you're like me. You know what? He's serious. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. How can God be for you? You don't know what I've done this past week. You don't know how discouraged I got. You don't know how sad I got. You don't know how I... Springer, open that heart and put this in here. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can bring a charge against God's elect that is successfully? Who is going to bring, who is he who condemns? Who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? And here's how you got to get it in your head, Springer. Here's how we got to get it in our heads. It has nothing to do with us. What? What? Where did you get that? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's God who justifies. It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. So tribulation or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it's written in Psalm 44, 22, for your sake we are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loves. Wait a minute, we're just conquerors, right? No, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is one individual that Paul knows we struggle with every day. Go back to chapter 7 verse 24 and 25 and he'll tell you who he struggled with every day. And that's himself. That's himself. And yet he makes the bold statement, who's going to save me from this wretched body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. The great physician wants to heal so badly and he's made room for us. Though millions have come, there's room for one. There's room at the cross for you. If we can serve you this morning in some way, let us know while we sing.
The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And its grace so free is sufficient for me. And deep is its fountain as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have have come there's still room for one yes there's room at the cross for you though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins we have sinned the savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. 262, before we partake of the bread this morning, 262, <clears throat> 262 before we partake of the bread. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count. That all may cleansed be in thy once open fount. I bring them, Savior, all to thee. The burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to thee, the grief I cannot tell. No word shall needed be, thou knowest all so well. I bring the sorrow laid on thee, O suffering Savior, all to thee. O suffering Savior, all to thee. My life I bring to thee, I would not be my own. O Savior, let me be there, never thine alone. My heart, my life, my all I bring to thee, my Savior and my King. To thee, my Savior and my King. Almighty God and Heavenly Father. We approach your throne of grace again, knowing, Father, that we are so unworthy, but because of your gift and your gifts you throw upon us today, that we have been made worthy. Our mind goes back to that first century when he, Jesus took that unleavened bread, gave thanks and divided it amongst the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. How grateful we are, Father. How grateful we are that we have the ability to eat the body of Jesus in the form of unleavened bread. Because Jesus said if we don't eat his body or drink his, or drink his body or blood or his, eat his flesh, we have no part of it. And so thank you, Father. Bless us, please, as we partake. May we do it as he commanded, this do in remembrance of me. In Jesus we pray, amen.
217 before we partake of the fruit of the vine. 217. Two hundred seventeen. Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth below, where men his grace would not receive, because he loves me so? He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so why did the savior mark the way and why temptation no why teach and toil and plead and pray because he loves me so he loves me he loves me he loves me this i know he gave himself to die for me because because he loves me so. Why feel the garden's dreadful dross? Why through his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loves me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave him himself to die for me because he loves me so and father we continue thanks there is no way no way we could pay for our sins without us dying because that's the wages of sin but we thank you for the free gift the free gift that someone took our place. Someone became the divine sacrifice. Someone we look up to, our older brother. And he did it willingly. He did it unselfishly. And he did all of that so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and not only have the hope of life eternal, but to have life eternal. What an awesome God you are. How inferior we are. Made worthy by the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the example that we can eat his flesh and drink his blood by now having the fruit of the vine. And Jesus said, this is his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Father. And we pray we do it in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Seven hundred fourteen. Y'all sound great this morning. Seven hundred fourteen. Glad you're here. And then we'll ask Chris Soto, if he will, to dismiss us in prayer, please. After we sing this song, first and the last stanza, please. 
When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sins we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. Man, thank you all for being here this morning.